thank you uh, for uh, inviting me. It's been real, really nice uh, to be in Paris this month. Um, really nice talks to watch as well, and uh, just really great, except the weather, but everything else really great. Um, <laughs> But um, no, and, and I mean, to be honest, it's the weather in a way, you know, it's a hundred year experience supposedly, so that's, that's nice too, I guess. Um, okay, so in this talk I'll talk about the um, in the three, so this is the equation that I will be discussing um, in this talk, and it's, um, it's the cubic wave equation in three dimensions. And so this equation is called, the, is called an h to the one-half critical problem. Um, And a lot of people already know this, uh, of course, and, and in fact, uh, Rowan talked a bit about criticality uh, on, I think, Tuesday. But in any event, just to um, get into, just to say what it is, it means that if you have a solution to this problem, or a, yeah, a solution to the equation, then in fact you have a, an entire family of solutions because you can insert a lambda and um, and in fact then if you check then you'll see that the the norm that's preserved under that transformation is the h1 half norm of your initial data and the h dot minus one half norm of your your initial velocity and th thus it's called a h1 half critical problem and and this is this is by no means a um, unimportant thing, uh, as again, as, as if I remind you of what uh, Rowan was talking about, um, he sort of sketched out a, a way that, um, for example, his, this argument that Christ and Colliander and Tao used to prove that if you have data that's, that's in fact ill post for data less regular than h to one half. So, so h to the one, so this criticality is, um, is uh, um, really is important. Now, uh, of course, he, he mentioned some stuff about how, you know, in the negative, to negative orders, then you sort of a Alice in Wonderland type thing or something. But um, for s bigger than zero, we, we know that that's, that it, in fact, that's exactly, um, that's exactly the right space to think about because we have this uh, local, well posing this result of, and this is by Lindblad and, and Sog, I think. Uh, yeah, it's by Lindblad and Sog, who are also from Johns Hopkins. And we have that we have local well posing this for u naught and u1 for u naught in h dot one half. Oh, oh, sorry. So we have local well poses for u naught in h dot one half, and u one in h dot minus one half. And just to remind what that is, there exists a t of u naught u one greater than zero, such that a unique solution. On minus t comma t, um, u is in L t loc, L x loc, L x just L x, and the solution depends continuously on initial data. Okay, so, 
so, so this is important, right? Because you have this T of u naught, u1, right? Because if it has, it can't just depend on the size. Because if it did, then you could always do some rescaling to show that, in fact, you had a global solution, right? Um, and, and so then, anyway, this is the um, sort of the, uh, I don't want to get to talk too much about the functional analysis and all that of this. But in any event, this is sort of the standard um, definition of local well posedness. Now, there's, um, well, good. Um, there's the, the goal that I was hoping to prove, and it's not done yet, is to prove that there's global well posedness and scattering for this problem. That's the goal. So, uh, global is pretty, uh, hopefully pretty clear from, you know, local and then make it all R, right? And then, but then scattering is that there exist u naught plus or minus in h dot one half and u one in h dot minus one half such that um, u of t minus s of t u naught plus comma u1 plus h dot one half uh, cross h dot minus one half goes to zero as t goes to plus infinity and then the same for minus infinity and s of t is the solution operator to uh, just the linear solution. So we have our, our solution. Uh, did it get all the way up there? Yeah, it got enough up there. Um, so we have a solution operator. So basically, it starts to look like a linear equation, right? And, and the nonlinear is just perturbation of the linear equation. Um, so this is, this is the goal of, of the defocusing case. So focusing, we know that that doesn't happen, right? We know that because, um, well, we, I mean, we saw a talk about that, right? We saw a talk about some type 1 blow up solutions and blow ups on a pyramid and other things like that. And, um, but but um, in the but this, this that was for the focusing problem. Um, for the defocusing, there's no such um, counterexample. So this is what um, I think a lot of people believe the defocusing problem scatters. And in fact, that's equivalent to um, saying that u is in LTX for R3 plus 1. So, so that this, this is equivalent to scattering. Um, yeah, it's a nice exercise to try to show that. Um, but it doesn't take very long. Uh, but I'm not going to do it. Um, okay, so, so then we have um, then two types of, of blow up, two types of ways that our, our function, our solution can blow up. And those are appropriately enough called type 1 and type 2 blow up. So the first type is is that you have the h1 half norm going off to infinity. t plus is the, you know, you've got some maximal interval of existence. And t plus is, is the end point of that. And we're saying that the h1 half norm goes to infinity um, One of those two um, 
one of those two time directions. So, so why, why is that? Um, why is that automatically? It, it automatically I rule out scattering, right? Because you just look at your um, you just look at your wave operator, and you see that. Um, Oh, yeah, so sorry, I didn't write it. I'm not going to bring it back down, but I should have wrote a plus or minus in front of the U1 as well as the U0, okay. But I'm not going to bring it all the way back down just to do that, so. Okay, th that's what I should have done. Um, but, but you see that, I mean, your wave operator is a unitary operator on, on subleft spaces. So, um, so if, if, if U of T goes, if this norm goes off to infinity, then automatically the game is over, right? This, you can't scatter. But, but even still, it might still fail to scatter even if, even if this type 1 blob doesn't happen. And then that's called the, the type 2 blob where you have it's less than infinity of the soup. But, but nevertheless, you still have the L4 norm. equals infinity. Yeah, so th this is, these are sort of our, our two types of, of blow-up solutions. Now, at this point then, I want to put this then in the context of a couple of other e problems that have been solved uh, by a number of people. And, um, the reason why I want to do that is to sort of um, talk about what we have and what we don't have here. So basically, we have these re the, that the um, the results for the most part, at, at least for the defocusing case, um, ignoring the leaving the focusing. There's of course the channels of energy, which is I think a little bit different than than um, the re or I should say it's a little bit um, it's a, it seems to me to be a, a new idea so that's different from uh, um, how I've um, than than some other ideas so um, because it's it's primarily uh, analyzing linear behavior right it's analyzing linear behavior at the exterior so um, but. In general, the the in any event, it, it's um. So let, let's say elements and let's let's say elements in common between the NLS and, and nonlinear wave equations. Let's say um, in in the the elements of proof for for example, you have the um, energy. critical wave. So this is UTT minus delta U. Um, in 4D, right? In 4D, then if you do your rescaling, you're going to have the concern, the, the norm is H1 cross L2. Um, And then the H dot one half critical NLS, which is in three D. So for for these um, types of problems, the elements of proof have generally centered around conservation laws. And then from that, then you have a um, 
you know, sort of a stress energy tensor along with that. So, so for example, the, the energy critical wave equation. Um, so when you, when you solve, for example, the energy critical wave equation, right, I mean, like, let's say you have radial data, right? So you have your Morowitz estimate. Uh, is bounded by the and then you have an energy so in the defocusing direction you have You know, you, you combine your, your conserved quantity and your, your Morowitz estimate, and then, and then you just use the, uh, for, the, for the radial case, and all you would do is just use the uh, radial cell blood embedding, right? And then you'd integrate it and you'd get, you know, an L5 bound. Um, and then, but then for the, um, for the non-radial um, energy critical wave equation in the H1 half critical NLS, uh, so these are works by uh, Kenig and Merrill, um, you have um, that, you know, you have the profile decomposition, right? So you, you find a, a minimal blow up element, and, um, and then you show, well, this is a minimal blow up element that can't be concentrated because, again, you have your, your Morowitz estimate, whether that's for the wave equation or the, the Lynn Strauss Morowitz estimate. Um, so yeah, and then, and then, of course, then there's the work of the energy critical NLS and, and mass critical NLS as well. And, um, a, you know, a lot, a lot of different people have, have worked on this in, in the audience and so on and so forth. But um, I think that the, um, the interesting thing to me about these problems is, in a way, they're very um, much type 2 blow up results. If you really boil, excuse me, if you really boil down to it, oh, I have to move, okay. It's, it's your, your cloth is scraping against effect. the microphone. Yeah. It's, it's not feedback. It's not feedback, the cloth is scraping. No, you can, it's okay. You move it up your collar. No, 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 it's not feedback. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll get some feedback on that and see if it, <laughs> <laughs> if it. It's, it's the wave equation in any case. Yes, that's right. We're studying the wave equation, doing an experiment right now. Um, but, but in any event, we have, this is very interesting to, has been very interesting to me because we have these results of, um, for example, we have these, or, or let's just say these three results um, for the energy critical wave equation, energy critical NLS, mass critical NLS. Um, we, have, we have a conserved quantity, right? We have a conserved quantity, whether that be the mass in the case of the mass critical NLS, that's just u squared, or the, or the energy, for the energy critical NLS. And so automatically we know type 1 blow-up doesn't happen, at least in the, radi in, at least in the defocusing case, right? We, we, didn't, we didn't really do anything. Other, I mean, whoever came up with these conservation laws, of course, did something. But, but there's no, there's no, there's no, it doesn't seem to me like to be very, that, that's sort of given to us, but then we have to prove type 2 blob doesn't happen for the mass critical or for the energy critical or what have you. Whereas in the case of, in the case of, um, but then, and then recently people have been working on now results for where you don't have these conserved quantities, right? Which is, of course, the result of uh, Kenig and Merrill as well. They just assumed that um, the H1 half norm was uniformly bounded. Um, but the, um, the interesting thing now is that, you know, in a way, the, the only thing that those ever prove is type two, no type 2 blow up. And some people, and I've gone back and forth in my mind about this, and now you have to listen to me argue with myself because um, I'm still not completely decided in my mind about this. But the, they're showing no two, type 2 blow up it's really the same issue, right? Whether it just so happens that these problems have a conserved quantity and that, for example, the H1 half critical NLS doesn't have a, doesn't have a conserved H1 half norm. But, 
but I mean, like when I did the end mass critical analysis, I didn't do any work to show that the mass was conserved, right? I mean, that, that was easy. Um, so, I mean, I, I figured that out like first day I was doing that problem, right? You just integrate it, right? You integrate it by parts. Oh, by the way, so just as a reference to Vlad, it, we're talking about, in all these cases, we're talking about a pr we can approximate with smooth data, right? So we never have to worry about uh, like what Vlad talked about with, you know, do you have a conserved quantity? We, we know, we, we, because we're dealing with strict arts estimates and all these results are perturbative, we don't ever have to think about a, a situation where we might not be able to integrate by parts or something. We can always integrate by parts as much as we want. Um, yeah, and, but, but, and, but then the, the other thing that's interesting then about problems where you, uh, problems where you don't have a conserved quantity is that you, in a way, you have these conserved quantities actually give you two things if you really think about it, not just one. They give you a conserved norm, but they also give you the mechanism by which they're conserved. So, for example, this H1 half critical problem of Koenig and Merrill, they, they have a momentum that's conserved. Well, that doesn't control the H1 half norm, but they have conserved momentum which is used for the Lynn Strauss Morowitz estimate, right? And that, that's why I talked about this energy critical radial problem first. That's really easy because in this problem you have both. For the radi in the radial data, it's very clear that you have both. You have conserved H1, H1 norm and you have the mechanism, you have a positive definite stress energy tensor which gives you a Morowitz estimate. You just put them together and use the fact that the radial, you know, radial symmetry, you use it and it's, it's, you know, it's, I mean, this is the proof. This is the whole proof of the, of the, of the scattering for the radial wave equation, energy critical. Um, and so, so then the question is, can we extend these results to other situations where we don't have a conserved quantity anymore? And, um, and, and that's a, to me, that's an interesting question because, and so the, the type two blow up results are in a way removing the harder of the two obstacles, but it's still an, addition, uh, an obstacle removed because you've removed away the, a, you don't have a mechanism by which your conserved quantity is conserved, and thus you have to, um, you have to do some more work, I think, to, to build up to it. Um, you know, even, even the mass critical NLS, you have the conserve, conservation of the L2 norm, which is extremely useful for the interaction Morowitz estimate. Right, it's extremely useful. Um, so um, anyway, I hope I haven't said anything controversial, but if not, I will move on. Um, I suppose if I have, I should just move on too. Um, so from now on, I, I'm talking about results in the radial case. Um, it's that spot again. Um, in the radial case, and there's a result of myself and Lowry that proved no type 2 blow up. And this is for r radial data. So, so we know that there's, we know there's type 1 blow up for the focusing problem. We don't know about the defocusing. We know about the focusing. We know there's type 1 blow up in the focusing case. But we show that in either case there's no type 2 blow up. And the second result is A, we have the cubic, oh, I would just say, scatters if Oh. 
So if I can uh, sh make a brief mention, again, I'm very happy about Killip going before me because now I can just mention. So, so we have data, data in h to the 1 half plus epsilon. But now look, this x to the 2 epsilon, that's, that's equivalent to saying it's in, that's like saying it's in h to the dot 1 half minus epsilon, right? Because you have 1 half plus epsilon minus 2 epsilon, right? So, so we're, we're just slightly around the, um, the critical regularity, both lower, lower and higher, right? So, so, so that's good. I mean, we, we want to, um, we don't want to be, we, because of our scaling, we want to have a norm that somehow interpolates the h1 half norm, um, or interpolates to the h to 1 half norm. But then we also, um, but, but if, so we have just an epsilon, right? So if, if any, um, if, if, if epsilon could go to zero, that'd be great, right? Because that would mean that um, that would be the whole result, right? But of course, as probably most people know, just removing an epsilon not always so simple, right? It's often the, the hard part. Right? Um, I guess now it's the hard part. But in any event, um, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, so let's see. So let me discuss how these results are proved. So for the, the, the first result is, is proved with Lowry is proved by concentration compactness. So we have a quantity, and this is just a L2 inner product, U sub T equals the energy. Right. This is the result of energy. So you, you've got this. This more. This gives you a nice plus conservation of energy plus additional regularity. It shows that your minimal blow up. Solution satisfies E U of T equals zero. So, so you, maybe this is even the wrong order. So first you show that in fact your minimal blow-up solution not only is an H one half, it's an H one, and then from there, then you know, okay, that energy is always conserved, and then you've got this nice uh, Morowitz inequality. Which says that um, you, know, you can, and then you you know take a time out, you know, because it's a derivative, so you take a time average and estimate the endpoints, and then say, oh well, then that shows actually the energy has to be zero, and then so in the defocusing case already, you know, then that means U is zero, in the focusing case, then you have a result of uh, Stovall and Killip and Vishan that say, well, if its energy is zero, it has to blow up in both time directions, but you've you've carefully chosen. The minimal blow you've taken the minimal blow up solution that doesn't blow up in both time directions. So, as I like to, as an analogy, I like to um, take an analogy to the Sir Walter Scott, who said, "Ah, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive." And now it's falsely attributed to Shakespeare a lot, but I looked it up once, and it's actually Sir Walter Scott. And so what it means is that so basically the idea of these concentration compactness, you'll say, okay, let's assume that it doesn't blow, that it that does blow up. There's a blow up solution. Well, then you've got this all this um, this then that actually means you've got a whole family of blow up solutions because of your scaling and things like that, and you can t and they're compact, so you can take limits and get another solution. And eventually, this blow-up solution is caught in its web of lies that it's created, and then you realize that, that it's not true, and, and so then it's done. And usually, the more people know about concentrated compactness, the funnier they think it is, or at least that's what I. Maybe it's the heat. I don't know, but I try to tell myself that it's it's a good idea. It's a good analogy, but but this is this is the this is the standard this is a standard recipe, right? I mean, you you you. But, but what's, what I want to point out is that for this type of thing, we have to get additional regularity, right? Because we don't, we don't have any Morowitz estimate that scales at the h to 1 half level um, in, in, the, in the, the wave equation. So we have to, to uh, do this work. Um, but, 
but then the the other proof is a bit of a different argument because this actually uses the I method quite heavily. Um, but again, so and and along with the hyperbolic coordinates. So this is a a work that at least goes the, the doing it in a hyperbolic coordinates at least goes back to Tataru who proved some nice estimates for data that's started in a compactly supported region. So let's let's take our data that we have that's in 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 this uh, norm over here. Well, we know that it um, is radial. We, so we know that. Um, so what Tataru did was he said, well, okay, so Here's our light cone. And let's say we start with data in here, in, in this part, region here, and then evolve forward in time, and we know it's going to stay inside this light cone. And thus, it's inside this, um, it, when, if he draws a, a hyperbole, uh, it's going to lie in, and Tataru's wasn't a radially symmetric result, but it's going to lie inside this hyperboloid then. And so if you calculate then the wave equation in hyperbolic coordinates, this is going to get you some nice uh, estimates on on the wave equation, but what what we for this this result over here we don't know that it's in it's it's compactly supported, but but what we do know is we know like um, about the finite propagation speed, and so we know that outside of a ball of radius r, our data is going to be small, right? Just just from reading off of this, we we know it's small the small h to one half norm outside that ball. So in particular, out here, the L4 norm of, of our data is, of our solution is, is bounded, right? So then we're just left with, back in the situation that, you know, Tataru, for example, had to deal with where we're just, you know, we're just taking, we're just inside this light cone now. And then at that point, then there was a, in, a good observation of Staffolani and Rupeng Shen, who realized that on that, in fact, if you were to shift to hyperbolic coordinates, so you have a v of v of tau comma s equals e to the tau cinch s over s times u of e to the tau cinch s e to the tau cosh s. Um, then if you if shift to this and then you want to solve on, um, on uh, you want to get your data on tau equals zero, right? Because then v sub tau, v is going to solve minus s over v cubed. So it's going to solve a, a cubic-like equation. Of, uh, and, um, but then out here, again, are, and, and I drew the picture wrong, because these, these branches should go towards slope 1, right? They should have slope 1 as, as you go along. But I didn't draw it right because I don't draw very well. Um, but you, you can, but nevertheless, it's, it's going to be pretty well approximated by, by the wave equation, right? By the linear wave equation evolution, right? Just because of the fact that you're starting with small data, and so the, you know, your remainder is going to be, you know, a small iteration of that. Um, so then the second thing that, and then there's a, uh, there's a result by Chaffelin, and then a further result by Rupang Shen, who observed that, um, in fact, look, look at this. So um, you have the um, you have the u of we have that s of v of tau comma s equals one half u naught e to the tau minus s times e to the tau minus s plus one half u naught e to the tau plus s times e to the tau plus s plus one half 
e to the tau minus s times e to the plus s u1 of s prime s prime ds prime. See, plus, and then for, and, this, and again, we're talking about s big, right? So we're out, s big, so we're talking about out in this region. So we're approximating with our, our linear evolution. Of course, um, in here, we're, we're going to have more, a little bit more difficulty, but we, we can handle that. Um, then, in fact, this wave equation has an energy EV of tau times s squared ds. So, so I, I might have forgotten an s squared ds somewhere, but that's, that's the polar coordinate integral, right? So that's just all that. That's okay, um, we have this energy, but now if you were to calculate the h1 norm of this, of this energy, right? So you, you're calculating the h1 norm of this energy, so you, you would take the derivatives of s times v of s and integrate it from zero to infinity. Um, and then you'd have a, another term left over from, you know, commuting your derivative in space with the s, but same thing. I mean, it, it, all, it all works out. In fact, if you, if you just directly calculate the derivative of your s v s, it's bounded by integral of u naught, and then do a change of variables. It's bounded by u naught squared r cubed, d or u naught prime squared r, r, r squared plus times r cubed dr. And then plus integral of um, r cubed u1 of r squared dr. And, and so, in fact, this is precisely your, if you write it out in, in, in just axis, this is a norm that scales like h to the 1 half, right? So the energy is controlled by a norm that scales like h. The energy of v is, con at least out at the at the wings, is controlled by a norm that scales like h to one half. Now, and then and then if you tried to, and then if you played with the ball, you know the energy you could rescale, of course. Um, and so so if you have u, you know, have a finite energy. So what Shen proved is if you have a finite energy u, that also satisfies this then he, you have a, a global result that scatters because he has this energy and then he also has a Morowitz estimate. But, it, but it's at the right scaling, right? It's at the scaling of h to the, of, of it's, it's, it's a Morowitz estimate that's bounded by h to the one, uh, that scales like h, to, that where the energy scales like h to one half. And you have integral of v to the fourth times s squared ds, or s squared times cinch, or cosh of s over cinch s ds d tau is bounded by your energy. So okay, so that's that's how it scales. But now, but you can do the exact same thing and show that this norm gives you good control over the h to the one half plus epsilon norm on tau equals zero as well. Well, now, at that point, what do you do? You've got the h one half norm controlled, h one half plus epsilon norm controlled. You want to use this Morowitz estimate, which clearly controls the L after you do a, oh, sorry, sorry, um, s over, uh, after you do a change of variables, this controls the L4 norm of u inside this cone. So then there's one last thing you have to do you have to show that your energy, your h to the one half plus epsilon norm is somehow propagated through. And you, you have to, well, you have to cut off in frequencies and show that, and get a Morowitz estimate and show that that energy of your cutoff, both one gives you a good Morowitz estimate, you know, controls the errors pretty well. And two, also the energy is bounded. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's where the long time strict arts estimates come to save the day, and they, and, and they get, get you good control on the errors, and then you get a nice bootstrap going, and you can control, 
you can control this for a Fourier truncated piece. And then the long time stochastic estimates just say, well, then the linear behavior, the behavior is basically linear at higher frequencies. So you put it together and, and you're done. So anyway, that's probably about it. Yeah. Question? Yes. Oh. Um. Uh -oh. You have an idea of the, of the dependence on epsilon about your constant. Uh, Is it really bad or not too bad? I I would um, I, I would guess it's probably like um, uh, at least one over epsilon to a power of some sort. Yeah. But but it could be even worse. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd have to get back to you on that. Yeah. Do you have no other questions? So thank you and okay.